the flashy money never gets respect today a lot of the startup approaches you build one product yeah you spend heavily in mark sense in marketing it's exactly like a steroid yeah i mean it's you do like, steroid you 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 will do well you, know, will, do you will do well. well but what are you doing to your body yeah and unlike you know in athletics uh, this is not like a one gold medal it's done this is a marathon but they'll say we are a category leader in this i say that whole category leader thing is a bubble that bubble will burst like there are 400 optical companies and we sold our software to maybe 150 of them and then 2001 the 911 attacks happened everything came to a screeching halt finished the whole business optical business those 400 companies maybe one survived me this is what i remind people you know you could have uh, in 10 years everything could be ai mm. but most of the ai companies funded may not survive He signed the contract. When he took me aside and said, "I'm going to give you some advice. You are an idiot. You don't know how to sell. You could have asked for ten times the money over a year. So you have to learn to sell. I mean, the first job of entrepreneur. You can be an engineer, great engineer, but you still have to learn to sell. You have to learn to go and make a sales call, convince the customer, take the bullets, all of it. Mm. Without it, you cannot be in business. Basically, we settle for the low wage jobs, mm. turning those machines, turning the knobs, operating the machinery." not the inventing the machinery jobs mm. we have to get rich before we grow old <laughs> this race against time we grow old and we are not rich yeah. we have a liability are you at peace right now or yes. there is still a search going on i tell you what you know what you see today is not Yeah. What happened yesterday, but it is something yeah, yeah. which is growing. And I also growing. have a trail. If you go yeah, to YouTube, but yeah, there's yeah, there, back yeah. in the nineties, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we were very curious to understand. You know, I look different then, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did it all start? So you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a. I mean, I wanted to be a prof. That's why you do a, a PhD. Yeah, I know. I went to be Princeton. Yeah. I mean, now when I was yesterday, somebody asked me, "What were you?" One of my employees asked me. So I'm 23 now. What were you thinking when you were 23? Mm. I said, "I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. I thought I'll, I was in my PhD program. I'm going to finish it and become a prof." Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking at 23. So then, over the course of the PhD, I changed my mind. In Princeton, this was in Princeton in yeah. uh, 90. It's probably about 92, 93. That's when yeah. I'm slowly thinking maybe this is not for me. Yeah. I don't want to be a prof. But I finished the PhD anyway. Yeah. I got an academic job. Okay. I didn't take it. <laughs> The last minute, so you actually, finished the program. You got I finished, a job. I got the. I finished the PhD. Got an academic job that I would have wanted. Yeah. Which you aspired for. That I aspired for, and they had applied for. This was an Australian National University. Okay. And they applied for my permanent residency. They got it, and then I called the consulate and say I'm not coming. I don't want the job. <laughs> What did they say? They were shocked. Shocked. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, you got the job and you applied for everything, and then you don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a such a life change so what a, what happened i had gone through you know during my last couple of years in phd already i thought that this is not what i wanted to mm-hmm. it's all too you know you are solving mathematical problems that are completely relevant to anything real But by the way what what phd was it my phd was in electrical engineering electrical supposedly engineering. okay but these days everything has become too abstract yeah it's become mathematics in the name of engineering that too irrelevant stuff mm as i used to joke it's not even wrong it's irrelevant <laughs> like nobody cares about this yeah but you will study some very obscure corner and you will write elaborate theorem the about it. it yeah yeah that's what i did mm. i didn't want to be doing it i thought uh, i'm an engineer i want to build stuff mm. i can crank this math but it's not it's not interesting anymore right so i i lost interest in it so i decided to move on that's why i didn't want to be a prof so how so did your like, family react to it Uh, they, I did. I took a job in Qualcomm, so okay. as a, you know, I, I became an engineer. Okay. And uh, that was a big change. Mm. And in Qualcomm is where I met. In fact, uh, there's a Delhi connection to Zoho. You won't know oh, that. Oh, okay. Um, one of my fellow engineers, Avnish Agarwal, is uh, is from Delhi, and he, the first day I meet him, I mean, he joins like three weeks after me, mm. right? He had a master's from Stanford mm. at that point. He says we should start a company. That's first like day. the very first day we first meet. Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I've just taken a risk. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've just joined Qualcomm, and he comes and says we should start a company. 
together. And uh, it, it's that kind of guy, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, he had that spirit in him. Mm. And um, then we, I was there actually two years, and he, he, is, he was there in Qualcomm all the way until very recently. Mm. He's the, he didn't become the co-founder, you know, but he instigated us into starting. In so he told you to start a company. Yeah, he you told started a company. He didn't start. He didn't, a he didn't join. He didn't join. <laughs> <laughs> he stayed in Qualcomm. Okay. I mean, green card, all those issues. Yeah. Then so there was a lot of issues, right? It's not easy to leave at a job. Time, at that time, yeah. Even now, but then it was even worse. Right. So he said, "I'll have to get my green card first, and that took him another five, six, seven years. So mm. all that. But that's how he. That's why he didn't join. But he was the one who actually, had, until he talked about it, I had no idea that I'm going to be starting a company. It was Avnish who actually put that thought in me. That seed. That seed, yeah, yeah. Wow. It was in back in 94, 94, I guess, 94. Actually, I left my job in 96, April. Mm. But uh, the seed was there and, and it was also part of it is all this talent from India. We, we noticed in Qualcomm, right? Uh, all of us, even then, I'm talking about even 94, a lot of the people inventing the technology were Indian. Indian. If you look at Qualcomm patents, mm. since then Qualcomm was a relatively small company then. Mm. And now it's like what, uh, you know, 25 billion, 30 billion revenue company. Right. But at that time it was a 200 million revenue company. I remember. Mm. You can wow. see that size like different. Yeah. It's like 100 times bigger now, yeah. right? It was a fledgling company. It wasn't making money. It was making losses. And they were hiring smart engineers and they were figuring out this new thing called CDMA. Yeah. That's what was happening. We were all part of that, and uh, and that's when he planted this seed. He said we should start, and the conversation, our lunch time, we always had lunch together, dinners together, all the everything together, right? Yeah. All the conversation would be why are my brother also was there, Kumar. In fact, in, Kumar in Qualcomm. Then okay. he joined about uh, three months into it. Like okay. I, I joined first, then Avnish joined, and then You're Kumar real. joined. Yeah. My your real brother. Yeah, my uh, younger brother, yeah. my real brother. So he also joined Qualcomm as a software engineer. Mm. You talk about how do you, uh, you know, what, why, why don't we have these companies in India? Yeah. <laughs> so that's really what we talk about. about it, like, wow. And and uh, in fact, uh, I used to joke. Avnish became a big fan of South Indian food because Kumar would cook. Kumar <laughs> is a great cook. Okay. So every day Avnish only got our food. Yeah. <laughs> Sambar and everything, right? Right. So he became a big fan of that food. His mother used to come and she would say, you guys have converted my son into a something. <laughs> <laughs> so if, take care of him well, you feed him well. <laughs> I'm sure the mother never had a problem. <laughs> never had a problem yeah. with that, right? But but our conversation was all, all this, right. over food and our this thing, all that. And uh, then we, hmm. Kumar came back to India okay. in 95 November. Okay. That's how it started. Like we would talk and talk and talk. Kumar one day said, let me go back to India. Mm. So he resigned his job and he took a flight from LA and came to Chennai. Okay. And uh, that's the actual genesis in a way. Then about that around the same time, one of my colleagues introduced me to Tony. Okay. And Tony was ahead of me in IIT, but I didn't know him in IIT. Mm. He was in the same, same branch, all that, but mm. I didn't know him. He was okay. two, three years ahead of me. Mm. So, but one of my, uh, yeah, Tony Thomas. Yeah. And uh, so Kumar had gone to India. And then my brother Shekhar had started a PhD program in Rochester. Okay. He joined with a full scholarship. Mm. And just like my experience, he, he tells the prof in three months, I'm going back to India. <laughs> <laughs> Again, okay, flabbergasted, right? Yeah. You come all the way yeah. and you join this program and you have a scholarship, you yeah, have money. You go some other kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kid and, and then three months later, you're saying you're yeah. going back to India. Yeah. That's what he did. Actually, he stayed exactly three months in the US. He joined in, in September of 20, I mean, 95. Mm -hmm. And then December, he was gone. He's, he'd gone back to India to join Kumar. Okay. That's how the whole analysis. Okay. These two guys went back. Mm. That's when my parents were really scared. Yeah. Because two of the boys who are both in the US come back and they have don't have jobs. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. saying they're going to start something. <laughs> <laughs> and then I met Tony. Yeah. Uh, in This is probably late, uh, early 96. Okay. And uh, Tony was doing, Tony was in Bell Labs at the time. He's also okay. a PhD like me. Mm. 
uh, he got his PhD in Johns Hopkins. Okay. I got my PhD in Princeton. Mm. I was in Qualcomm, he was in Bell Labs. Mm. Bell Labs was the capital of a lot of these things, but already starting to fade. Yeah. In fact, uh, Tony was given a buyout, as they say. That means that you leave the job and pay you to leave the job. They were they were laying off people. So on and so on. So he took that. Mm. He said, okay, I'll take it. Because they, it was clear that the glory days were over. Yeah. So he left and he started something at home mm. in New Jersey. And that's when I linked Kumar and Tony. So and they started working there and they were doing something. something and, and why don't you guys work together? And yeah. that's how it started. Okay. And I left my job in uh, 96 April. And I moved to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. to figure out what to do. Okay. And uh, this this thing was going on with Tony and in Kumar was going in the background, mm -hmm. but nobody had any money, right? It's all yeah. uh, it's all stuff. Well, people are doing, home coding, trying coding, uh, trying to do something. And then I moved, and I in three months I ran out of money. You know, my savings were exhausted, so I did some contract programming. I did something in Silicon Valley. I worked for actually, in briefly, I even worked for Cisco, a division of Cisco, okay. for briefly about six months. Mm -hmm. I was a contract programmer. Mm -hmm. And so I did all of this to survive, bring right. in some money. And that's when uh, we went to a trade show. This was in 97 and for software, I'm, I'm like signed up as a salesman. Mm. So uh, that's now you know why. Yeah. Wow. Nobody, you know, Tony codes, my brother is coding and who will sell? Some cash coming in. Somebody has to sell. So I became <laughs> the salesman. <laughs> wow. So I go to the show and uh, we demo the software and it actually sold. It, 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 we found customers. Okay. We phoned, interested. In fact, our early customers were all Japanese. So but I still Japanese. have a soft car. Yeah. The, the trade show was in Las Vegas. And it's not easy to please Japanese people in terms of um, product. Yes. That's what but, I hear. True. But see, in this case, see, I'll tell you the, the interesting thing about Japan then. This was a lot of Silicon Valley companies had uh, some Japanese connection, including Microsoft, Apple, mm -hmm. all of them. Okay. And why? Because see, Japan was uh, still... Remember, this was uh, the t stage of 80s was Japanese superpower yeah, yeah, yeah. As, a, as, a, as an economic superpower. Okay. 90s, the bubble had burst, but still Japan was still riding high. Yeah. It's sort of like how China's image is now in a lot of things and even better. Right? Right. Japan was even bigger at that time. And they would, a lot of their companies would mm -hmm. cooperate with small fledgling startups in Silicon Valley for okay. critical new technology. Okay. It turned out we had something that they wanted. And uh, like we were building, that? yeah, so we were building, uh, Tony, it was Tony's background. Tony was building network management stuff for Bell Labs. Okay. Managing networks. Mm. It's at Right. So you build vast networks. Right. He was writing software to manage those networks. Mm -hmm. And when he left, he decided to do the same thing when he took the buyout. But this time with the focus, maybe we'll go sell it to the, the guys who sell the equipment at AT&T. Okay. That was a goal. I take my software, your uh, you're equipment, equipment and sell it. I'll give the solution to AT&T. Yeah. Because I have expertise in that area, right? That's what that's what he started. And then my brother Kumar and Shekhar and other, they had already brought on board a couple of more friends, mm -hmm. all that. Chailesh was now our, no, uh, our heading our labs. Yeah. He was a classmate of uh, my brother Shekhar. Okay. So he joined in Chennai. So we were all doing this. And uh, then in this show, the, we showed the software, suddenly, now unexpected, mm -hmm. unexpected, this was unexpected. The Japanese printer makers were there. Okay. At that time, Minolta, mm -hmm. so Minolta. Kyosara, yeah. I think they all merged later. Mm -hmm. Rico, mm -hmm. even Canon was in printing, copying. Yeah. They were all there. They all showed interest in our software. And only later, I mean, I analyzed it, why are they so interested, I figured out the reason. Their primary competition was HP, Hewlett Packard. Right. And HP was a leader in management software. Mm. HP had a very good network management software. And they didn't. And they didn't. The Japanese didn't. Mm. And so what do they do now? So they find this small company there and these guys have something. Yeah. And uh, you know, and the Japanese already thought Indians know software. Mm. So even by then, you know, I'm talking about ninety seven. Yeah, so they said, okay, well, why don't we well, partner with these guys and mm. you give us the code and we'll ship with our equipment. So we, that year, 98, we crossed a million dollars in sales on the strength the of this. 
it was like the second year. Second year. Say first year there was little money or no money. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly we find ourselves the million dollars because of all these deals we are doing. Right. Kiosara and Minolta and then Rico came and Rico. then Canon came about a year later or like that. Mm. Then eventually even Xerox came. Oh. Xerox itself came. In mm. fact, Xerox was a big customer by 99, 2000 because again, same reason. Mm. For everyone, the main competition was HP. Right. And HP was a leader in the software mm. and they didn't have the software. Mm. So we figured this out and we wrote that little mini wave from million to two million to like, it went up to eight million. Wow. And then we also diversified into other equipment, similar mm. network stuff, other so switches. So who else would need management? So management software, all of the other network guys became customers. And then the optical boom happened in Silicon Valley. Mm. 99, 2000, it was the original dot-com bubble. It was known as the dot-com bubble. But there was also a telecom bubble. Mm. As you, you cannot go, you know, like five miles without hitting like three optical companies. Right. They'll say XYZ networks or this optical saw that. Right. And you go into their labs, they all look very shiny, blinking lights, you know, all the fiber optics. Yeah. Well, 25 years later, the world, whole world is connected with fiber optics. But those companies don't exist. Don't come <laughs> but they were the ideators. They were there, they were they started it. Yeah. But most companies die. Yeah. You know, it's like that's how it happens always. But that's the nature of bubbles. Mm. Like there were 400 optical companies then. Mm. And we sold our software to maybe 150 of them. 150? Yeah. Wow. So that was the prosperity during that period where suddenly, like, boom. Yeah. There was one year where our revenue tripled. Triple. It's crazy. Like yeah. It's like over a year. It's impossible to keep up. Right. Because you, I mean, we don't have enough people to satisfy the customer. Mm. So we are like, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, house on fire kind of situation because customers calling and there's not enough people and we can't hire enough fast enough all of that yeah because when you triple you are you're just crazy growth month yeah. to month you're watching that thing and then 2001 the 9 11 attacks happen yeah everything came to a screeching halt finished <laughs> the whole business optical business those 400 companies maybe one survived in the end just one one yeah you in other words the scale of bust you witness Mm. That is, that's uh, something. Oh, I mean, and I knew even in uh, in the peak of the time, I knew that there's so many companies, they cannot all possibly survive in this market. Mm. But what I didn't know was that 99% of them won't make it. <laughs> like I kind of knew that, you know, there's yeah, a bubble going be on. Hard, but it'll be hard for all of them. Everybody would die. Everybody would die. Literally. And that's what happened. There is no hardly any optical networking companies in Silicon Valley. They all got consolidated to Cisco and a couple of guys. Yeah. So that's how it evolved. Mm. But then they were all our customers. Yeah. So in 2002, three, hardship. Yeah. Like we uh, actually had to go through like very, you know, uh, tough, time. tough times. Luckily for us, we diversified into Japan a little bit. And then we had China. Mm. In 2001, we signed up a couple of Chinese companies. In two, three, they took off. <laughs> they took off. There was a they Chinese took, uh, telecom wave. The wave coming. Mm. That's when Chinese, these companies like Huawei today and ZTE, all these companies that are world leaders today, mm. they were all taking off then. Right. They were like, you know, $100 million companies. Now Huawei is a $100 billion company. So I mean, a thousand fold growth. Yeah. I literally, we were supplying software to Huawei when they were small. They would send engineers to Chennai to work with us. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. But they were smaller than they. They were not That's matching the scale of the U.S. companies then. Correct. But still, when, when your revenue is dropping that fast, mm. any revenue was good. Right. So, the Chinese companies were, at that time, for a couple of years, we actually did well in China. So, while all of this was happening, now your parents were happy? Yeah. At that point, they knew, no, we had a business. Have, we knew how to... We had a business. Uh, we were settled. And then the 2001, 2, 3, we had to re, uh, reinvent ourselves. But you stayed there. You I was there uh, primarily handling sales. Primarily. I was okay. handling sales. Till and, the bust. Till the bust. And, and then, uh, the and then uh, re resurrection was, we had to diversify our markets. Right. The silicon market isn't going to cut it. Correct. To come to the realization takes a year. You are in denial. Yeah. Nobody wants to accept it. You probably think next month they'll yeah, be better. Yeah, some of these companies back. will come back. Yeah. And even your sales guy tells you, no, I see some signs of revival. It's all false, right? Yeah, but 
you fool yourself <laughs> because you don't want to believe, right? That it's gone, it's over. Yeah. That phase is over. So right? isn't that natural that people start a business and they're stuck to a market, they want to service it yeah. well and they want to create a focus and core there and it somehow gets completely overlooked that what if this goes down? I mean, all our eggs in one basket. That's what happened to us. Yeah. I mean, but to think well, Telegram natural. is a huge market yeah. and then the optical revolution was happening, the cable modem revolution was happening, the wireless revolution had started mm. and still there was a huge bust. This is what I remind people, you know, you could have, uh, in 10 years everything could be AI, mm. but most of the AI companies funded may not survive. May not survive. Both will be true. Yeah. You have to account for both. Yeah. That's what bubbles do. That's what bubbles do. Yeah. So, I mean, there are innovators, early adapters, yeah. and then there is a rejig. And then there's also, you know, in all these, Strategy, luck, mm. everything plays a role. You know, some companies may have a fast ride, mm. but they don't have a staying power. Mm. They don't have a how to stay relevant and mm. things change on them. Mm. There are companies then that just get unlucky. Mm. Yeah. Then there are companies that get acquired by others mm. during this whole gold rush period. Mm. There, are, there was a company I remember, it sold to Cisco at the peak of the bubble for $6 billion. Okay. A year later, they would not have commanded even $60 million. Wow, what a drop. <laughs> Cisco overpaid, right? Overpaid, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were lucky. They just sold at the peak at $6 billion. Yeah. So that's an example. That's very All these example. stories were there. You, you could see it then. You got a precursor to, you know, bubbles to come later. Yeah. <laughs> even bigger bubbles have come. But so, it, it's very interesting, you, you know, how you've sort of narrated this, you know, story where uh, there's so much happening, but I, I, you know, I'm curious to un learn from you. On one side, you have your, you know, family, your brothers, and then you have uh, Tony. You know, Tony as your partner. Yeah. So it, it's, it's it's kind of a partnership here, and most people are quite wary of yeah. a doing partnership, b doing partnership within family, because you know you have limitations of what kind yeah. of conversations you can have, hard, soft, or strategic. And who's going to lead it, who's yeah. not going to lead it, who's going to do what job. So how did you manage all that, you know, mathematics uh, there? Tell you one thing. So this happened early on, like 2000. Just, you know, you have it in your thing. There's an uh, acquisition offer came to our yeah. company. And uh, $25 million. Big amount. And a big amount, you know, then. So, and uh, for, we were doing about maybe four, three, four million dollars. Does this actually happen in 90? Nine early, I think I remember. Yeah, and um, I assembled our, my you know all, all of these people. We had a discussion, mm -hmm. and I said, look, we have because I am in sales side. That's why I hear this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I said, guys, we now have an option to sell or or stay, and and if we don't sell, we could we may never see the money again yeah. because it go bust. Yeah. Even then, I was aware that these things. So could you were swing for it. it? No, no, I was not for it. I said. Are you we were have a showing them the yeah both that these the are the both sides yeah because I don't want us to be in an illusion come back huh? illusion right yeah. we we have to be aware that this whole thing may not work out hmm. then we may regret not taking the money then hmm. so let's all nobody wanted to sell nobody wanted nobody wanted to sell so then I said well shall we make it a forever we won't sell hmm. this is it we now we took a life changing decision right now let's say this is forever now that's 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 basically our agreement throughout. Nobody wants to sell. Oh, that's where the seed of never seed of taking outside, outside money. Outside money, all that came. Because, see, the thing, all of us, have, we have a lot of arguments, fights, as you can imagine. Mm. But all of us are, you know, one, one strong belief. Nobody is really addicted to money or wealth, any of them. Tony Thomas, uh, you think I'm simple. He's an extraordinarily simple man. Mm. And uh, I think he's... He's very camera shy, so he doesn't come much in public, but he's my guru in many ways. Wow. He's my guru. So mm. <laughs> he's, I call him my Buddha. Mm. So he's very, very calm temperament. Mm. And uh, he's never, never been swayed by money. Mm. And same with my siblings, all of them. Mm. So that is the reason why in any differences we could work out because it's not, money was not a motive. We never had fights about money. We'll have fights about strategy. Can we go into this market? Should we go into the market? Should we do this technology? That technology, all those very fierce fights, but right. never about money. Is there 
I mean, can people do this by design yeah. and framework or this is it's, you? Uh, it has to be, you know, it's how you grow up, right? And my parents gave us the, this framework of how, how to live. And uh, Tony, the same thing for him, similar. We all come from a particular middle class Indian background and particular time and place where, you know, where in, in particularly down south, right? Mm -hmm. The flashy money is never gets respect. And that was always true. So that was, you know, sort of inborn in yeah, the culture. Yeah, it was there in the culture. In the culture. So in the culture. It, it, it never it looked like yeah, a yeah. tough decision. It looked like. Which is why it is you would have heard southern businesses are very conservative. Conservative. It's often, it's often true because that, that flashiness is kind of uh, devalued. In fact, there is a similarity with Japanese culture there. Yes. Same thing in Japan. They're very simple. Very simple and uh, I mean even now you'll I mean, hear they that. They have all the riches yeah. and wealth but they're very simple in outlook. Even now like a Toyota CEO will take the train to work. For example. Right. That's just how they are. So, mm. so we should learn from them. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, but, but you see a lot of flash now with the uh, new business. We have uh, definitely. We are learning some from uh, uh, you know, American flashiness all that too. Mm. But we have retained our roots in Zoho. And that's what we want to be, and I make it clear to our employees, this is how we'll be. But so. isn't it uh, interesting that uh, most of our product and hard work is actually serving the flashy markets? Yeah. And that's where the real money to build more product is coming. Yeah. So do, do you think this is how, you know, the balance in the world exists? Well, I'll see. We like to think, and, and a lot of what we provide is very essential mm. software, essential technology. We are working with a lot of uh, uh, cases where the, we would be the first software for that company, mm. or they are saving a lot of money using us. Mm. We are the non-flashy choice, mm. regardless of the company, often. Right. That's one. And again, I like to think in the same way the Japanese always thought about this. Right? I Meaning, we take a company like Honda, it's a role yeah. model. It's been around what 75 years now, 80 years. Mm. Still going strong. You still, you know, Honda cars are valued there, quality, all that. Same thing, Toyota, all of that. In fact, Toyota, this is not known. You go to a, I go to a Paimatur textile industry, mm. the spinning mill, critical machinery comes from Toyota. That was their original business. Wow. Their original business was making those uh, spinning weaving, spinning weaving. All oh. those machines. Yarn. Yarn, all that. And they still are strong in it. They are one of the top three in the world. It's that not the original business. That's the original business. The car business came from that. Hmm. They said, hey, this is similar machinery, we're going to make cars. <laughs> wow, that is nice. So for you, uh, how's been the journey, you know, from a engineer to a salesperson and then driving that entire company in the initial years? How important is that role for all the entrepreneurs who are trying to create legacy? Because, you know, they get started, <coughs> I have a product, I know it, but they never think well, about that, who's going to take it to the market, who's going to advocate it. This uh, early on, one uh, lesson we learned, which was back in 99, we finished a deal in Silicon Valley with uh, actually an Indian customer, I mean, customers from India, but he was in a startup in Silicon Valley, he was like the director of their software. It's one of these optical companies. He was the head of software. He decided to license our software as part of his offering. Exactly the business we were in. He signed the contract and he took me aside and said, I'm going to give you some advice. You are an idiot. You don't know how to sell. You could have asked for 10 times the money I would have given it to you. Wow. <laughs> so hire a salesman. Learn some sales. <laughs> you don't even know what's the value of the software you're selling. Mm. So that's when I... I had a salesman and that's, that's, I don't know, we, we hired our first salesman after that. Mm. Until then I was a sales. You can tell how good a job I was doing that a customer calls me an idiot. <laughs> so, that is so interesting. Uh, that, and, and that's where... Uh, and the salesman turned out to be Cindy. <laughs> oh, and uh, that's he a, knows that's, sales. <laughs> he knows sales and <laughs> Yeah. So, so I think that's where a lot of people who do yeah. amazing work leave yeah. a lot of value on the table. Correct. And then so you have to learn to sell. I mean, that's the first job of entrepreneur. You can be an engineer, great engineer, but you still have to learn to sell. You have to learn to go and make a sales call, convince the customer, take the bullets, all of it. Mm. Without it, you cannot be in business. It's very hard. Yeah. 
So how was the post.com, post 9-11 era? Very tough. Uh, so we a lot of big decisions to be made. Yeah, two years of, uh, like two, two and a half years of tough times where mm. we didn't have a path. Mm. And then uh, finally we settled on our new path, which is you know, both Manage Engine and Zoho were born mm. out of that whole you know, and then the company became Zoho Car out of all those decisions we took. That, mm. as it used to be called Advernet before. That was the original right. business, networking really really business. And in fact, we did the last, the end of life of the last piece of that just last year. The software from that era, still servicing customers. Slowly the customers were dying out. and You're weaning finished. them off. Uh, no, that market is over. Just, uh, no, it's finished. But they were still using it, so we're still supporting them. Oh, you're still supporting 20 them. years uh, now, just last year, finally, end of life, because now no more shut down that whole thing. Okay. But by then, it was a non-event. Right. The company had evolved so much. This is not even 0.001% of revenue now. So. Correct. <laughs> it just was there, like tiny. Just to support around, the client. Uh, support yeah. the customer. Commitment. Two or three customers will be there, uh, and they still need our support. So we would support them. And then they would eventually move off. That equipment is obsolete. They are end of life again. They'll tell us. Mm. So we end of life our software. That's right. what happened in the last, about a year ago. Mm. So that the final chapter was written only last year for the wow. whole optical bubble, all of that. And but we decided to move into more business software. Mm. There, not just a telecom stuff. Manage engine was one mm. thing, and Zoho was a cloud. We decided to, that's why we purchased the domain. So it was a domain we purchased to find that good domain name for our cloud initiatives. Right. And, and that's we, how the name, that's how the name came. And we were, no, we came from Soho, the small office, home office. Yeah, I read and about then, it. Yeah, and then the, we put the Z and we go and check and it says this domain is for sale for $5,000. Uh -huh. And uh, why the name price was named is that the court was liquidating that asset. Okay. This was a company that had taken funding. Mm. I believe like $53 million or something in the dot-com bubble. Okay. They were doing a kind of a CRM for hospitality industry. Mm. And then they went bust. Like the dot-com bust. They were not just the name, but they were actually in that business. In the kind of a related business. Kind of a related kind of business. A, but anyway, they, it was bust. Mm. The court was liquidating all the assets. Their mm. computers, servers, all that. You know, Silicon Valley had the efficient thing where recycling yeah. of all this, right? Correct. We simply were recycled name. <laughs> <laughs> we bought it for five thousand dollars from the literally from the court auction. From the court so auction, you can't negotiate. Yeah, they name the it price. It's a price. Right? It's a price. Yeah, take it or leave it. So yeah. we just bought it for five dollars. In fact, Raju Pegasna was our chief evangelist. Mm. He was the one who insisted we buy it. Mm. I said a domain costs six eight dollars. Yeah, why do we pay five thousand? He said, No, no, trust me, this is a good one. <laughs> so and it is. It, <laughs> it was is a good, good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good decision. But then then. You know, you were going through this tough time. Most people, most businesses go through these cycles, yeah. right? And this was one of those low phases for you. Yeah. And obvious choice is to fire people, cut costs here, you know, stop everything. We actually did have to let go some people in the U.S. We oh, had, okay. we had grown a sales team quite a bit. Hmm. And then sales completely stopped. Right. What, so do, what do you do? It's sales people. And you have nothing to sell. Yeah. You literally have nothing to sell. Yeah. In fact, there was a year period where you go to the office and I don't know what I should be doing. There's no call. There's no customer. Yeah, no Everybody's dead. Yeah. yeah, nobody to call. Yeah. So we actually let go salespeople then. But that was the last time we. Uh, that was very, you know, that time I decided we'll build a different kind of company. We cannot be like this exposed. Mm. So it was like formative period of rethinking everything, our strategy, or how to be in business, all that. So and I had to let go some salespeople about. Uh, 10, 12 of them, I remember. They all went and found other jobs, but yeah. So what were those key three principles that you said that, okay, now you've gone through this, we've learned a lot. These are the three things we're never going to do in our lives, and they will be the guiding lights of ours. I mean, two, well, three, what were the key principles you said? Clearly, what we have to be aware of the dynamics of markets we are in. Yeah. We were aware that there was a bubble. I mean, at we some aware. level, I was yeah. aware. I yeah. mean, I knew. So you were all riding because of uh, the yeah, and then, uh, you just don't know when it'll end. Hmm. Uh, this is the first time in, right? You don't know how it's going to turn out. Yeah. It turned out it was like beyond the worst imaginings of what you would have imagined then. Right. And um, then there was 
also the you have to have a diversified mix of business that is something yeah. that was clear you cannot be exposed put all eggs in one basket and i also didn't want to repeat the layoff <laughs> yeah it's very painful to have the layoff painful. people so so those were the kind of things we learned hmm. during that period so uh, how was your you know core team your brother and tony how what was the what was going through their mind like who was calling the shots is it a joint decision it was all uh, most all we'll argue over it we'll come to some terms mm. and uh, we had the differences of opinion on various things mm. which market to go which all of that it was really collective decision day and and yeah. i am the ceo so i should take some responsibility for those two but really it was a they were all always with me in all mm. this after we finish all the arguments we kind of come to an agreement right <laughs> So did anybody leave by choice that we, okay, um, guys don't actually they are, because of the difficulty of the markets mm. my brother decided to try something new on his own both my brothers kumar and shekhar tried new ventures because there's not not much you know this market is not enough to yeah. sustain all of us at that point Correct. we had to do something new so this company itself evolved in this direction they both had companies that they have done well and, and uh, they are but they still associated with no mm. so that's how it has been they have both followed the same principle they never took money okay so both start companies in chennai the 200 300 employees each mm-hmm. and kumar's company got acquired by zoho last year oh that okay. was another okay. part of the same family yeah. now <laughs> yeah exactly so, so they, they ended up doing their own point of sale there was a point of sale software point of sale okay in Boss. fact uh, kumar became a retail software leader in india wow go for this company and now that is back in yeah, go frugal go frugal yeah that is his company yeah yeah, yeah. now that's part of the zoo right. well, no, no. we have a retail product. point of sale yeah so a lot of uh, you know if you go to airport shops and all that they'll have their software yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have recently started a retail business. that is his branching off uh, yeah, yeah that that was at that, that time at that time 2003 yeah. 4 and he's built that over the yeah, built it over the 20 years so yeah okay right and i mean he sold it Yeah, now to Zoho. Yeah, mothership, you know. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> so actually, he's an investor now. He is doing a lot of investment in a lot of companies. So that's part of the reason. So uh, why? But also, because see, it, it synergistically it fits with all the Zoho stuff. Now yeah. we have a commerce e-commerce software. We didn't have a point of sale. Right. So we have a full suite now. Yeah. So part of that too. So so many products in the Zoho portfolio, yeah. and all are doing well. And you know you're innovating new but as an umbrella company as a brand you know how do you you know market all of them effectively many people say we won't we don't market them very effectively but uh, i mean part do. of part of it is again i'll give you our approach to yeah. business right today a lot of the startup approaches you build one product yeah you spend heavily in market sales and marketing mm. for now often you look at even a company that's achieving 100 million arr mm. you go look at their numbers mm. they'll spend 70% sometimes 80% in sales and marketing mm. they'll spend like 10% in r&d mm. so that's very common so you'll have like five days is it good huh? is it good that's in any so, situation that's so that's the prevailing wisdom that that's good i disagree with it you completely i, I, I completely disagree with that i okay. think that's a wrong approach yeah but of course it works for them they you know because they achieve that fast growth it's exactly like a steroid yeah an athlete, i mean you do steroid like, you 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 will do well you, you know will you will do well. do well but what are you doing to your body yeah and unlike you know in uh, athletics this is not like a one gold medal that's done this yeah. is a marathon yeah or you do you have the staying power for 30 40 years those companies don't have the staying power when you do that 80% sales and marketing spend Mm. your entire culture is driven by the short term month to month quarter to quarter like goals yeah, exactly and that's why they go up to some level and then they either stagnate or sell to private equity or sell out and get out yeah it's very typical you mm. see this repeatedly this pattern yeah we disagree with it so we'll be in that market in fact in many many individual product segments mm. i can name some for example take our zoho sign signature yeah. product mm. you have this company called docu sign yeah that spends what 500 times in sales and marketing as we would spend on that 500, 500 times. times yeah yeah wow. and they will call themselves a category leader in e signature mm. 
I'm going to tell you there is no such thing. I mean, this is part of uh, somebody wants to just pay for signature and then pay for something else and then pay for single sign on, pay for subscription. You know, you see yeah. how many things you end up paying. How for. many hooks will you put? Uh, exactly. Hmm. And a typical now, you know, you can take a 200 percent company. Take Josh Talks. You will see that you will have to use like 20, 30, 40, 50 different kinds of things yeah. to get work done. Right. Are you going to have 50 subscription? And each costing like twenty dollars a month, this and that, and different terms, and they don't all work together well. Yeah. And to make them work together, you buy more software. Yeah. To single sign on, no, provide single sign on across them, you buy another software, and you pay another ten dollars a month. That's the prevailing wisdom. I think that whole thing is bogus. It doesn't and I work. I always believe, you know, any new software you add, you're actually adding twenty people in exactly. the company. Exactly. Correct. And the whole thing, I I look at the whole approach of business mm. as the present day equivalent of the bubble we had in optical. Right. In other words, this idea will die. This idea is wrong. Mm. But once the money tap dries up, this, this, this thing will dry up, then you will see companies with a long-term strategy, long-term outlook. Mm. So we are actually, that's been our approach all along because I saw that bubble then. Mm. So. But then, should people not look at private money at all? Not, see, Definitely when you need money, you need money. But where is the money going? What are you spending that money on? Or are you, are you spending it to build R&D? Hmm. Or are you spending it just to acquire customers? Hmm. And the, it's crucial difference. Because if you are, one, you're building a long term. The other, you're building a short term growth. You're buying it at the cost of potentially a long term relevance. Hmm. You don't have enough R&D. You don't have enough depth. Hmm. I'm going to tell you, a DocuSign doesn't have strategic depth. No, they, they do one thing. Yeah. But it has to, for example, it has to come together with an office suite, it has to come together with email and chat, all of that software. They don't have it. And they're not even discussing that. They are not even be part of the solution, exactly. not something which is sitting outside exactly. and you need to pay me right. my money. Right. But they'll say we are a category leader in this. I say that whole category leader thing is a bubble. Is that a bubble will bust, yeah. That's what I, that, this is these. Even if you're a category leader, you're a category leader from this time to this time. Exactly. I mean, you have to exactly. exist forever. Exactly. What is the 30 year strategy? They don't have any. And that's the problem with all this. So how do you see business? You know, is it like a T20 or a one day or a test pack? <laughs> this is actually a marathon, an evolving marathon. marathon, life marathon. That's how I see business as. Hmm. That's how the Japanese saw business as. That's how the Koreans have seen. That's how TSMC, Taiwanese hmm. see. In other words, you look at, take TSMC, Taiwan. It's a yeah. great example. Just 10 years ago, TSMC will beat Intel in fabs, in uh, semiconductor. Uh, beat Intel and they have beaten Intel. Your iPhone chips, your all of the chips are made in TSMC fabs. Mm. They have the latest, the four nanometer, five nanometer. Uh, the they're shrinking the transistor dimension, right? The microchips, yeah. Theirs are more advanced than Intel's. Intel has been struggling to keep up mm. with TSMC. Mm. Just ten years ago, that notion would have been absurd that Intel, the global leader, would struggle to keep up with the Taiwanese. This is a contract manufacturing foundry. In other words, TSMC doesn't make its own chips. It fabricates the chips for others. Mm. But they have the best technology for it. Meaning Apple would, cannot go anywhere else to mm. fabricate their latest iPhone chip or their Mac chip because TSMC has the best foundries in the world. How did they get to that? If you go back, 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 89 they got founded. Yeah. They had to raise money. This is a difficult business, a very capital intensive capital business. Intensive but business. they put all that money into you know, refining their manufacturing technology. Mm. And that technology is so hard to set up a fab in India to catch up with that is minimum 10 year effort. Maybe minimum 10 years. Minimum 10 years. Yeah. And even then, 10 years later, we don't know that we'll be catching up with and that. And something can happen in those 10 years. Exactly. So it'll take 10 years to even say that we are in a striking distance of that. Maybe 15 years. Um, I know. That's how tough that business is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about it, 60% of all the chips that we have in all of our stuff is made in this island, mm -hmm. which is about the same population as Sri Lanka. Wow. About 2.2 2. 2 crores. Taiwan is about the same population as Sri Lanka. Yeah. And they make 60% of world's chips. World's chips. <laughs> and that's why China How do you get to that level, right? <laughs> It's R and D power. Yeah, that's what that's. Those are the companies we learned from. So.
So you also getting into hardware now? That's yeah, we are getting. We are basically any critical technology hmm. that we are not investing enough in India. Yeah, we want to get into it, but we can't do everything. So we pick and choose. Hmm. Like for example, I tell you, we have to be investing in bullet trains. We need bullet train. Hmm. I would ideally between you know Chennai and Delhi, you could probably travel in six seven hours. Yeah, uh, you know if you have the right high speed yeah. trains. Yeah, and uh, I would love to, to live to see that day when I take a train. Yeah. Between Chennai and Delhi, fast train, right? But we need the technology behind mm -hmm. all that, and we need, uh, of course, planes and defense technology, and we need fabs and in, in drones. You name it. So why have you know all these good technologies and innovations always stayed with the West? Why uh, not India? It's actually now not just with the West, with East Asia too. Yeah. Koreans have technology. The Japanese have technology. Of course, the Taiwanese have technology. Now the Chinese have. For example, the largest drone company in the world mm. is DJI, Chinese. Yeah. Six, seven, eight billion now in drone. They are the leader, world leader in drones. Mm. So it so it's not just the West, also East Asia has done it. Always the focus on R and D. Mm. I mean, I, I'll come to the humble you go to any rural shop in India, mm. try to buy a nail clipper. Mm. It'll say made in China or made in Korea. Right. Why? And and I I I it's went down this rabbit hole. Huh? It's, it's not. no, it is actually it's trickier than that. Okay. I went down that rabbit hole. Uh. I asked why can't we make a nail clipper? Mm. It turns out the metal, metallurgy, we don't actually invest in the metallurgy R and D. Our steel companies only invest in the commodity steel. Yeah. Like the stuff that you build buildings, yeah, free bar, all that. Yeah. But this is specialized alloys mm. that have to hold the cutting edge. Mm. It turns out it's not just the nail clipper. Your dental instruments, mm. that steel is also very special steel. We don't make those. Mm. So you go to a dentist, all of the instruments are important. Because you go back, it's not the instrument alone, it's the metallurgy. Mm. We need to make alloys. I mean, right here in Delhi, in fact, this was in one of my presentations, we have the iron pillar yeah. that has gone, lasted 2,500 years. Ashoka iron. So we knew how to make metals, yeah. metal alloys. <laughs> We but just we don't today. We lost it along the way, right? Yeah. So we have to regain it. And that's part of So if you ask me, so where I will invest next, if I find some very sharp metallurgy team mm. that's interested in making these alloys, I would invest in that. It's very strange to, you know, that, that this, this feeling and this commitment coming uh, from you because, uh, you know, you have built technology and this yeah. is manufacturing, this is metallurgy, this is material. But it's the same R&D though. All of it is the same kind, the soft, whether it's an email system or a, or, a, or a video system or a metallurgy, mm. approximately the same kind of work goes on, I'll tell you. In fact, a lot of it is done on the computer now. Mm. Even your metallurgical R&D now yeah. is material modeling, a lot of that. Maybe 50% of the work now is R&D is in yeah, the computer. Prototyping, modeling. Yeah, modeling is in the computer. You may have some small, you know, the thing is R&D is not, itself is not, you don't think in giant factories. Hmm. You think in like small workshops hmm. where you are, you, are, you are doing recipes. Hmm. You are trying various recipes. You are hmm. characterizing them. You are hmm. collecting data. Hmm. You are forming manufacturing processes. Hmm. That's, that's how even that business is. Then you eventually productionize it. That's when you think in manufacturing scale all that. Mm. And there's another piece of technology that we don't have in India. If you go to any big factory, mm. all of the capital goods, all of the factory machines are imported. Yeah. And uh, exactly. I tell you, this has a very serious economic implication. And uh, when we basically we settle for the low wage jobs, mm. turning those machines, turning the knobs, operating the machinery not the inventing the machinery jobs. Mm. So we need to be competing for Swiss jobs and the Japanese jobs and the German jobs, all that. Mm. But otherwise, if we don't do this, well, you know, already in Tirupur, in textile belt of uh, in, uh, yeah. southern India, the businessman will complain, hey, our tailors cost us 20,000 rupees. Bangladeshi tailors only cost 6,000 rupees. And, go there. and then Kenyan tailors only cost 3,000 rupees. The same machinery. Mm. I say, well, your competition is not Bangladesh, your competition is Germany, where you're buying the machinery from. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell them. If you don't aspire to that, mm. it'll be a race to the bottom, right? Yeah. So we, if we want a prosperous nation with the equitable distribution of our you know, uh, prosperity, mm -hmm. 
we definitely have to invest in R&D. We have to figure out complicated stuff. That's one thing that if, if there's only one thing young but, people take from it, this is what I want them to take. Which is very important. Yeah. And do you see this happening because our education system does not support or in inculcate this? I, you know, you ask the Japanese. Hmm. Traditionally, they always also blame their education system as rote learning. Hmm. And Korea is notorious for their exam addiction. Yeah. And China has their Gaokou, their entrance yeah. examination. Like, that's a, I like the same thing. They're no different. Mm. If anything, they trap their kids in this, this exam treadmill even harder than we do. Mm. You know, whether it's Korea or Japan, anyone, right? So, I don't, I, no, in other words, it's just that somebody has to get this start at this hole. And R&D is, in fact, I'll give you an analogy to R&D, you will be shocked. It's sort of like making movies. You're yeah. assembling a crew, you're trying ideas, you have a lot of failure rate. Yeah. Some, and you don't know what will succeed. Yeah. Suddenly something is a hit and you don't know why. That's R&D. Yeah, you're trying all these things. In place. Yeah. And so we already do that. You mm. know? We do Bollywood well, right? So it is just that our corporate sector is not tuned to that way of thought. It's more of them, it's not education systems, not any of that. It's not talent. Obviously, it's our people are going they doing R&D. Or they are they are risk averse. It's see the mindset of a business person is I invest so much money. And it, when is the return? Mm. But R and D has a you know I'll, I'll I'll state it this way. Business people want to reduce the uncertainty of their capital. Mm. In R and D, you have to embrace the uncertainty. You have to accept that intrinsic uncertainty. But that's the that's the key problem. And the mindset shift, and and but the other side of it is it doesn't cost as much money as building a factory. Mm. Like I talked about this metallurgy, right? Yeah. Maybe two three crores a year, five crores a year, can actually get you a very good metallurgical team. Mm. That's not a lot of money for any of our companies. And with right? that, you can build. Build, yeah, and that could be the seed of some a billion dollar business. Supplying maker. machines to. <coughs> exactly. Mm. In fact, I, there is a YouTube video, it's worth watching. I always refer engineers to it. Okay. There's a German company that makes these diesel engines mm. for the ships, portion going ships. Right. They make this one megawatt, two megawatt scale diesel engines, the largest in the world. Okay. These ships need gigantic, and the, the engine itself is the size of a bus. Right. And this company makes, one or, only one or two companies in the world makes it. Mm. This is a German company. They make maybe $500 million revenue out of it. They have no other competition. It's like if you want that class of engine, you are, you go to them. They actually build their own metal alloys. They make their own alloys. They have their own foundry, all of that. Their recipes, the metal that goes into the engine is proprietary. Wow. They don't disclose those trade secrets. And that's what keeps them... Yeah. And they say if they get that wrong in this big, uh, this thing, the lifespan will go down. Mm. If even a hairline crack in mm. that, in this giant machine that will destroy the efficiency and the lifespan of the engine. Right. So they have to get it exactly right. So that's the type of high precision engineering at vast size. This company makes the whole thing and there's a one hour uh, YouTube uh, video on no, this whole thing. Watch that and I'm sure it's worth watching it because Google. you learn the attitude behind it. Mm. Like they don't just make the engine. They make the metal that goes into the engine. Mm. They may cast the alloys and all of that. So they control the whole narrative. They hold the whole chain. The design, the alloy, right. yeah, exactly. the technology. And a lot of people are working on computers. Yeah. <laughs> They're true. So that's the mindset you have to get. If they can do it in Germany, we can do it. And in fact, this is another interesting part. This company is in some smaller town in Germany. Mm. Maybe 40, 50,000 people. Mm. You go to Germany, it's full of these, dotted, they call it the Mittelstand, the, the middle companies. Okay. And these are not world famous names but they are very crucial for the German economy. Mm. And because they supply these critical technology. Similarly, museum glass displays. Yeah. That specialized glass is made by a German company. Mm. Similarly, our all of our cars, 50% of our cars have a part stamped by a machine made in Switzerland. Mm. It's called Fine Tool, mm. that company. They make these specialized uh, stamping machines. It's mm. called uh, Fine Blanking, that process. Only two companies in the world make that machine. Wow. So essentially all of the automotive companies are their customers. Mm. And this company is in a small town, population 20,000, lies Switzerland and uh, 20,000 people. 
why can't our equal and 20,000 people in uh, UPR in, uh, in, uh, yeah, can't we do it? If they can do it, why can't we do it? That's the question I ask. So is it the evolution of the country where we are right now from being poorly developed to developing to develop? We, Our first of all, people need to know these stories. Yeah. It, it, the, they, before they all of it, up, the mind has to open up. Hmm. That's it. That's it. You just said it. They have to believe that we can do it. Hmm. They have to first study this company and say, hey, they are doing it in a 20,000 people town in Switzerland. And why can't we do it? In fact, I my village is about 2,000 people. Mm. For everything, this shirt, everything, I go to a nearby town, about 20,000 people. Mm. I ask in that town, if a Swiss town can build it, why can't we build these machines here? Mm. That's how I motivate our kids in the school, college, all that. So, what do people say when you ask? They actually slowly, they get it. Now yeah. it's that, that awareness is rising. And, and uh, wherever I go, this is what I say, I talk about. I was in Kerala last week, mm. two days I was in Kerala couple of events, I said the same thing. Mm. In fact, we opened an office in a small town engineering college in Kerala. Okay. Called uh, Kotarakara. Mm. Kotarakara is a small town, about 40, 50,000 people, about two and a half hours from Trivandrum, three hours from Trivandrum. Mm. And we opened a small R&D center. Mm. I said the same thing. Mm. If a small town in Switzerland can do it, a small town in Kerala can do it. We just have to aim for it. <laughs> And when you talk about the, you know, these kind of innovations that are happening in different parts of the world, and they're actually very critical for the economy and yeah. to the large businesses, exactly. how have they, and of course you, have tied away or you know kept these big giants away from getting acquired, getting influenced, getting killed? You know, yeah. if I can't buy you, I'll destroy you. You know, people get uh, that attitude. Take also. this company, Fine Tool. How do they survive? They have very critical technology, hmm. which none of the giants make, so the giants are their customers, <laughs> right? So you can invent your way out of trouble, that's that's how it is. And, uh, invent your way out of trouble. trouble. Yep. And so you have to keep your R&D culture alive, mm. and you have to keep staying relevant, and you have to keep figuring out new recipes, mm. <laughs> new formulas to make hit movies, Right. in a different way of thinking. That's, that's really what business we are in. So today you see Zoho as a large organization which is consolidating products in the Indian market or you still feel that we are still a startup and we are in a constant fear of we are still a startup from the Google or we are still a startup you know we are at a billion dollar scale yeah they are a 250 billion dollar scale yeah that's a factor of 250 right there right we are still tiny <laughs> even at a billion dollar we are tiny right so. And we are still working hard to, you know, uh, win new customers. We are doing well. I mean, um, next week I'm going to Middle East, Saudi Arabia. Mm. We have a very good customer, growing customer base there. Mm. We have a growing customer base in Dubai, mm. UAE, all that. And we have a growing customer base in Europe. Mm. So we are doing well. Mm. But still, you look at the size difference, you know, the challenge. So. so is there a constant apprehension of fear that your team, uh, you know, brings to you that, you know, this could happen someday? Yep. Uh, look, anybody in private sector has to be aware that you could be rendered irrelevant. <laughs> that just goes with the territory. Anybody in private sector. Yeah. It's not just us, right? Anybody. So you are, and, but I liken this way. I tell my team, look, guys, we get out of the office today. Mm. We are not guaranteed to come back tomorrow to work. Mm. So there's all the risks on the road and all that. Yeah. So all those risks we are taking, we are living with it. Mm. You know, our, our traffic and all of that then why just magnify this risk alone? This is being rendered irrelevant by competition mm. is one of those risks. Yeah. It's not even the biggest risk. Mm. Or individually, our bigger risk is traffic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's what I tell them. So put that in perspective. Right? This is something to worry about, but not obsess about. We don't obsess about, you know, hey, am I going to get killed by traffic today, right? Mm. Then why are we worried about this? Mm. Let's also have fun doing these things. Right. I read that, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, you, you, you give jobs and you train are not actually having formal education, yeah, degree. degrees. They just probably have yeah. a certification under your, Correct. you know, your team's ages. Yep. And they learn coding and everything there yep. or whatever job they're doing. Yep. So, I mean, are they able to become confident professionals, individuals? Uh, that, I, you know, I don't have a fear that this is the only place outside of this, I, I won't be relevant. So how no, they... Actually, totally, they, they come. In fact, uh, 
industry values this for people. Industry values our people. Mm. And so this came from, again, look, look at our industry. Practically everyone from Bill Gates to Steve Jobs to Michael Dell to Mark Zuckerberg, everybody is a college dropout. Yeah. They are. Right? Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, I calculate, you know, if you want to be very calculating about it, by spending six or seven extra years in college and PhD, all that, maybe I left another $10 billion now of revenue. You could have started earlier. Yeah, it started earlier, you know. See, think about it. You could have compounded further, right? Yeah. So, it's, you know, in reality, you take a smart 18-year-old, they can actually do the work now. We can train them to do this. Six, two, six months. In fact, these days, all schools are learning. It's not just kids who, who are come from uh, um, poor backgrounds who don't have money to go to college. Mm. In fact, we have kids from Delhi coming to Chennai to join our thing who are perfectly capable. They come from upper middle class families. They're choosing to be choosing there. to be there. We have uh, actually every year we get two or three from Delhi and from Pune and Mumbai, all that. Mm. They come to us. Mm. They say we want to enroll in those schools. <laughs> and we want to learn from this. So because I don't want to go to college. Right. See, these days also, you know, everything is there online. Mm. MIT has open courseware. You can learn all the basics of a lot of stuff very quickly. Mm. And learning by doing is the best learning of all. You build stuff, then you learn the principles. So. And what motivated you to start development centers in rural India? Again, it's a, um, I had always observed that whether rural Japan, rural Germany, mm. uh, even rural US at that point, mm. rural Switzerland, mm. classic, they all had cutting edge companies, technologies. So you, I knew theoretically you can't do it. That's the first thought. The first idea is you know the potential, it can be done. There is a... There is role models. Right? Role model you study Switzerland, there. you study Germany, mm. and then why can't we do it here? Then it's only a question of maybe, a, it's again another form of R&D. Mm. You try two or three approaches, see what works, what doesn't work. We, we have our own peculiar challenges, right? Every, every thing, it's not like it's going to be easy, mm. but if you stick to it, we'll get it done and that's how for Tenkasi operation happened. Right. Now we are spreading everywhere and actually our latest is Sonbadra district in UP. That's in where UP? we are. Yeah, in UP, yeah. We have a, right in the starting area. a center yeah, right in the Vindhyas, the northern part yeah. of Vindhyas. It's a very strategic district because it's four states meet there. Okay. The neighbors are literally Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, UP. I mean, UP, of course, they are in UP. Yeah. So all of the states meet there. <laughs> That's where we are going there. How big is that facility? We are just starting now. Just Again, starting. it'll be like five, ten people in the beginning, mm -hmm. but slowly we'll build it up. And why here? Um, the world's most demographically richest place is right within four, three hundred kilometers of here. Mm. You, if you want the most talent, mm. most talent to train, that is there in. South doesn't produce enough kids now anymore. We actually get a lot of people from the north now, right? Mm. So go where the source is, where the kids are born. <laughs> Why do you that South doesn't It's more? actually the birth rate has dropped steeply. Oh. Both Kerala, Tamil Nadu, all that, you look at the numbers. Mm. It's well below replacement now. In fact, to the point where schools, colleges are shutting down. Are shutting down. I am getting pitches from schools and colleges. We don't have kids. We don't have money to run. Mm. Take it over. Mm. Use it for something else. <laughs> Use the infra for? Yeah, in the, because we have the infrastructure, use it for something else. Mm. I'm getting these pictures every, practically every week now. Wow. We yeah. have like 600 engineering colleges, not all of them have enough, enough students anymore. The birth, the number of, I mean, I'll give you numbers. Mm. All of India, 20, we peaked at about 27 million babies a year. Mm. Now it's 22 million and dropping still. Wow. So we are already down by 5 million from the peak of India. Mm. Meanwhile, China, its peak was 28 million, mm. a little bit ahead of us. Now it's 9.5 million. How they've come down now? Can you believe? Wow. Their number of kids born in China has dropped by 66% from the peak. In India it has only dropped about 20% from the peak so mm. far. Mm. But dropping, dropping, dropping. So we can actually, if you want to know where it's heading, you can watch China. Yeah. And those are the, a lot of, the, of that, the, 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 again, that's how I predict stuff, that's how I predict stuff, right? Yeah. The same forces are operating. 
Yeah, everywhere, even in UP, number of kids have come down. Mm. But it's still slightly at the replacement or above. Mm. Like compared to, say, uh, Tamil Nadu now, UP may have half a kid more <laughs> per, per woman, right? Mm. But that makes a difference when you go on the ground. You get yeah. more talent to hire. So, will it going to impact our economy? You know, the we have to evolve. See, China went through the same transition. Hmm. We have to get rich before we grow old. Hmm. <laughs> it's a race against time. Yeah. Because the number of kids is dropping. If we grow old and we are not rich. Yeah. We have a liability. We have a liability. Yeah, exactly. So, we have to grow richer before we grow older as a, com as a country. Hmm. We still have a lot of youth. But this is the demographic dividend they talk about. Which is why this whole Amrit call, right? The, yeah. the next 25 years are very crucial in that sense. We capture this youth power. We direct it to this R&D, that. Because, again, you cannot do this R&D with people very old because you need to get into this area and, and figure it out. But do you see that hunger and that sense of urgency in the youth that are coming on board? I'll put it that way. There is a, at least a segment of youth who have it. Who have it. That's what matters. Hmm. It's not like everybody will be a metallurgist or a... Drone no, maker not only technologies, but you know, like we need to work there harder, is enough of that. you know, there is enough. 70 hours a week. There is, there is enough people with that. It's, mm. see, you, you always capture a subset of people who have that hunger to do it. Mm. So, like we are investing in a drone company right now. Right. And these guys came back from Germany. They, mm. they were in, born in India, but went to Germany to work on drones. Mm. Come back to rural Tamil Nadu to start a drone company. So I'm I'm seeing the 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 drive there, the passion, because we need to invent all the drone technology here. Right. That's the kind of company I want to invest in. Absolutely. And that's essentially is going to be our route for the riches, because India with its R and D, with its talent, with its low cost manufacturing, yeah, uh, and ability to sell to the world yes. where the margins are, right. uh, you know, create the riches for the or, or even to sell to ourselves. I mean, we are buying a lot of, of course, stuff you know, now. Outside, <laughs> of, outside yeah. of the existing captive exactly. market that they have. Yeah, yeah. We, we still have a vast untapped market segments evolving. And when I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, I mean, one of the things that they feel immensely challenging, you know, they have done well in a city, you know, doing well business, business-wise. Mm -hmm capturing the market, building the riches. The moment they go out to another city, you know, they tend to fail or tend to suboptimize. And sometimes they're able to, but then when they go yeah. to a state or international, but at Zoho, you've done that, you know, not only at the city level, at the rural level, but at the global level and the multi-country level. So how do you build this, that, you know, you are able to sell an India-made product and software, of course, there was a tailwind there. But how do you build those international global businesses and you, talents? You benchmark yourself against the best. Okay. Though we build a piece of software, we don't think only what will sell in our market. Has to be worked. You ask us. how will a Dubai customer see it? How will a Berlin customer see it? Would they, be a, would they want to buy it? Why not? Mm -hmm. So you have to benchmark yourself. That's the, key. That's the key. First, you have to get the product right. Then only we can make the sale. Get the product right. Then you have to invest in the global market. Exactly. Which market, whatever market. the global competition is, mm. make sure we are competitive, make sure we are relevant, mm. make sure we can stand up against an evaluation, tough evaluation. That's really all of our business we won by a tough evaluation of customer conducts mm. between Microsoft and us, between DocuSign and us, and all of that. And especially in tech, there's always a challenge of turnover yeah. of people. Yeah. And you have maintained a very low turnover. Yeah. And not only turnover, but you've actually uh, have people in, as you call it, tier one village yeah. uh, locations. <laughs> How, well, because, you know, any, for anyone to, to, to take a decision to move out to a location like that, you know, where will my kids study? What about yeah. my weekends? All of those things go through your mind. You know, my, my parents are away. How will I commute? So how do you keep people yeah, excited but, there? Yeah. Okay, and I'll... You see, everything is not for everyone. Yeah. Take uh, take this village, the rural living. Mm. There is a segment of us, some number, who likes this. You know, I I love, love it. For example, I'm I'm uh, I've always been like that. Mm. Even from you know, eight year old, I was like that. Mm. I just preferred the you know empty spaces, wide open spaces. Go and 
sit in the pond and think. Mm. Now, I'm, I might be thinking about I mean, studying Newton's laws. Yeah. But when Isaac Newton was sitting in a you know, small town, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah under so, the tree. <laughs> right, under the tree. So that's why I, even now I do my thoughts and all that, I'm doing compiler design, whatever, in, you know, in a very, very, you know, very rural setting. Mm. And a lot of people like that. Mm. I don't know how many, but it's not like everyone wants to be in the city. Mm. There's first people who live there who like it. There's people who live in cities who want to go back. Mm. So you target those. So we we don't force anyone to move anywhere. Okay. Uh, people come tell, by people choice. People come by choice. And do you yeah. sell it that this is how you? Uh, I'll give you an example. Right in my village right now, in this very deep rural Tamil Nadu village, where ninety nine percent only speak one language, Tamil. Mm. I have a doctor from Bengal, Kolkata, mm. a very renowned hematologist. Mm. He moved there and he is now doing handling our rural healthcare initiative. Mm. He volunteered for it. One day I get a mail from Kolkata mm. and Dr. Pratar Chakrabarti says, I'm Bengali, mm. but I want to move to rural Tamil Nadu and I want to start these rural initiatives. And I'm a hematologist, mm. but I'm going to come back and do some different thing here. I said, come along and talk and I, I talked to him for a few months and we chatted and he really wanted to do it. I said, do you really, you have to learn Tamil and all of that because nobody here speaks Bengali, right? Yeah. <laughs> or Hindi. <laughs> and he moved. He's there. And, and he's heading he, over and he's now starting to train uh, other paramedicals, all that. He's a, you know, he's very highly credentialed doctor. Hmm. But now he's sitting there in rural India. What, rural what Tamil Nadu. Him? You have to ask him, but he says, I love it here. He, he likes it there. Yeah. But he, would, he wouldn't want to do something similar in... Respect. He, you know, because I'm already all these initiatives, yeah. he saw me online somewhere like this. And yeah. That's how he just... Got inspired with you. Got inspired and sent me mail and he came and visited. Mm. He stayed with me three, four days with his mm. family and then he said, we'll move here. Mm. I asked his wife, I asked his daughter. They all said, yeah, we'll move. <laughs> so... The whole family moved. The whole family moved, yeah. yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah? Very, very interesting. Yeah. So you you invest in your business as a company, yeah. but personally, do you have any passion investments that you pursue outside of our, outside of your business? Oh, everything I do is related to either this theme of R and D or mm. RD rural development. <laughs> Only two R &D things. R and D or RD. RD. <laughs> <laughs> very well said. Yeah. Very so. well said. How do you see the whole AI revolution, machine learning taking over? Uh, Especially, yeah. you know, tech companies are looking very carefully. I'll, I'll give you a broader, uh, you know, some of, you know, I don't know how many you know, clear watch Star Trek, you know, the replicator there, mm. the Star Trek replicator where you go and say, make me this and it'll give you, or, or give me the iPhone, it'll give you an iPhone, right? Yeah. It replicates one, as yeah. I say. And uh, so you can imagine the automation technology where nearly everything is made nearly at zero cost. Mm. It's possible. And computers, I mean, AI robots do all the work, everything they do. So what do humans do, right? Mm. And uh, then I ask people, this is not actually a problem. Humans are very good at, you know, doing something else. It's not that. The problem is the distribution system. In other words, if you have to actually pay for that stuff, the question is, how do we get the income to pay for it? If the stuff is actually free, we are not complaining. Mm. For example, so far, even in Delhi, air is free. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, you can imagine some entrepreneur saying, I will import air from New Zealand, mm. bottle it up and sell it in your apartment. It will come through our vent and yeah. it will be, you know, we'll, we'll just like gas cylinder, we have air cylinders, compressed air and from New Zealand. You know, there's a solution in Delhi which is selling right now like a hot cake in farm. Uh, it's called the Alpine Air. Okay. So they set up a so system. somebody is already doing it. It, it. it comes in the AC. So, your, you know, your pollution inside is 2.5. And outside is 500. And right. So people okay, are doing so that. Okay, so doing it. So you can see bottled air business, right? Mm. Well, if the business didn't exist and air is free, nobody is going to complain, right? Air is good and free. Nobody is going to complain. The issue is that if you have to pay for the air, where do you get the income to pay for it? In other words, our political economy problem is very simple. Mm. Production is becoming, you know, is driven by technology and automation. Mm. Consumption is about how income goes to the consumer. Mm. And we are not deriving income from production anymore to consume. These two have decoupled. Mm. The 
consumption has become a political economy problem. Mm. Production is a technology problem. These two are decoupled. The consumer is not getting income from production mm. to consume the product. product. Right. That's it. And this problem has to be addressed in a holistic way. And that's why a lot of R&D is get the rural citizen in on this whole value addition game through R&D. So to me, that's why I said, to me, R&D can only happen through R&D. Rural development requires our research and development. Because if we don't take part in the production economy mm. of creating all this stuff, mm. our consumer will have to go into debt. Country has to go into debt. That's totally unsustainable. That's the problem today. This problem has to be addressed. So will government address it or? It is, it is not just government. It's mm. private sector has to invest in R&D. We have to get the know-how. We have to acquire these technologies. Mm. No. So that, that cannot be done by the government. Mm. The government cannot invent the metallurgical alloy or the drone or whatever. That the private entrepreneurs, engineers, we have to do it. Mm. And in fact, uh, you know, like the government put that, uh, you know, your 2% CSR. Yeah. There has to be, I feel, uh, certain businesses with certain scale must contribute certain percentage in their R&D, R&D. to get better. I, I agree with you. See, our percentage of GDP we spend on R&D is one of the lowest. One of the lowest. Like half a percent, one percent. Yeah. And a good economy, we have to spend four or five percent. So our companies have to do it. It's not the government alone. Mm. See, again, I don't want it to be thinking this is not a Nobel Prize academic problem. Mm. This is very much about figuring out how to build a better drone kind of right. problem. It's very practical stuff. Yeah. And... People who want to start new businesses, build legacies, should they carry on with the existing, like AI, machine learning as a compulsory element in their thought process? Or it, uh, every is industry is going to be affected by it. it every every the reason is you can now you take something even metallurgy, hmm. the job of searching for better alloys, given some physical properties, parameters, all that, it could be automated through AI. You can suggest try this. Mm-hmm. And if of the 10 things it, it suggests, maybe three things work. Mm-hmm. That you, you speed up the human, uh, this thing, right? Now somebody who sells that kind of software, which will speed up the discovery or invention of these alloys, whatnot, they will stand to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. The question is, are we in on that? Correct. If, let's say, a, a region of UP specializes in that type of software, now they are in on that. Mm-hmm. That's how we should take. We need to take the whole ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. we ability. need to build these. The good news is it doesn't take, this is not like a 10,000 people problem. Yeah. It's really a 10 focused people problem. And then people follow. Yeah, follow, yeah, exactly. You know, for you, uh, uh, how's the typical day like? like you know, what, what, what is it in the day that you really look forward to? Usually I wake up early, four, and I get maybe an hour or two of some thinking time on my technology, I do some coding, mm-hmm. all that. That's when I get my technology work done. Okay. And then yoga. Okay. Sometimes a swim mm-hmm. when, when the pond water permits. I mean, the water is drying up now. Yeah. Then we have to wait till June for the monsoon. Yeah. For the ponds to fill. It's not like I have a swimming pool. I just go to the pond, yeah. the village pond and swim. So swimming and then... I go for a walk around the village or you know, sights and sounds. And, you know, our traffic jam is the cattle crossing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be, you know, yeah. good to live like that. Yeah. I'm only about three and a half hours from the Trivandrum airport. Yeah. It's a different world, completely different world. The cadence is different. When you're there, you kind of get to that slower pace of everything, right? Yeah. So then I have calls. Oh, video calls and whatnot, and mm-hmm. uh, then I have meetings. Sometimes visitors, a lot of visitors come. Mm. Uh, a lot of people visit, like the doctor mentioned from Kolkata once, right? Yeah. Like that, a lot of people come for various reasons. They want to check this out. They want to do this. They are doing this. They want to learn some lessons and all mm. that. Mm. So I probably on a given week, maybe five to ten visitors. So I'm always busy. <laughs> Something. So in your sector or in your related sector, who has tried to emulate your model? 
Have you seen a lot of smaller companies doing it now? Doing it now. They are not well known yet because mm -hmm. they 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 have not broken through into the uh, you know the publicly visible yet. Yeah. But I hear about I hear from entrepreneurs all the time. Mm. They say I am doing it in Telangana. Mm. I am doing it in Maharashtra like that. People mm. write to me saying this. So right. just to just FYI kind of thing. Right, right. Keep us in your thing kind of thing. <laughs> no, that's very very uh, yeah. you know motivating and inspiring. Yeah. So and how much time of your month you are in the village and how much time do you really I, travel? I I like to keep it about 30% travel i have to do travel mm. i just went to the us mexico mm -hmm. and now i'm going to saudi arabia next mm. week mm. then maybe for a month i'll say no i'm going to stay here mm. but i have to come to chennai bangalore i come to often mm. business mm. meetings customers all that too come to mumbai for customer visits right i've come to delhi for i'm also an advisor in some <coughs> the government right. for some roles right. i have to come for some meetings but i try to keep it about 30% 30% yeah so your your personal <coughs> state of mind right now you know after achieving so much you know it's it's not about uh, you know just the financial success it's about you know proving the model and you know showing the world the right way it should be done or the way you feel mm -hmm. you know it is creating more impact so are you at peace right now or yeah. there's still a search going on i tell you what see i talked about r&d wealth creation value addition rural development all that but then what's the end mm -hmm. you see take the average americans energy consumption per capita take the average indian it's a factor of 100 or 200 energy in joules right. physics right? right how much petrol they will consume how much all the natural gas to how much electricity units of consumption yeah. it's a factor of 100 really if we develop, we get to that factor of 100. We, we, maybe we increase our energy. Already, you know, coal consumption in our country is increasing at about 10, 12 percent a year. Wow. With, in spite of all the sustainability. With our size, we're going to be uh, bigger liability uh, than U.S. Yes. And so, the world earth cannot afford this. Mm. We are definitely frying the earth with all our stuff now. And already, you know, see the pollution in Delhi, all that. Can we take... 10 times more emissions. Mm. Can we take 10 times more cars? Mm. That's what we are looking at, right? Imagine if all of UP has the same car density as Delhi. That's 220 million people. So that's the end of development, right? That's the end goal. Everybody will have cars, everybody will have this. We haven't actually figured out answers. So part of my rural uh, thing also, along with this, this is actually comes from uh, our leading saint of Southern India, Kanchi, uh, Mahaswami. Mm. And he said all of our spirituality can be summarized into two words, humility and contentment. Without it, we don't have spirituality. Without humility, without contentment, there's no spirituality. That's what he said, he taught. And uh, we have to embrace a simpler way of life. It's not for just ourselves now. Mother Earth yeah. and Bharat Mata. <laughs> We have to protect our rivers, our mountains, our trees, our animals, all of this. We have to, to gravitate towards a simpler way of life. This is what my parents taught us mm. and from the beginning. Even though my parents have a very simple lifestyle. Mm. So they are a role model for me. So then I, I always ask, you know, this all the money is doing some good, right? Yeah. We're investing in R&D, we're investing in schools, clinics, all that. But why should I have to be personally increase my energy consumption, all mm. of it? Mm. What am I trying to prove? Mm. So that's, I think this mentality has to come. This is there. If there is one country that can figure out these answers, that is us, Bharat. Will we do it? I don't know. Because we, this is urgently needed now. And why do you feel we are well positioned to? Because we have those spiritual roots where we, the, see the whole, take economics now the field of economics. GDP is God. More is always better. Mm. That's all of economics equation is driven by that. More, 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 more cars, more emissions, all that, right? Well, more is not better now for the earth. And no economic theory has ever figured this out. Mm. So if we don't ground our economics in some holistic idea of life, 
how life should be. But we don't have earth. <laughs> we don't have humanity. Correct. That way. Earth will be there, but humanity won't be there. So that's why I think it's important that we figure out these things. And to me, the answers are in again in plural. Plural life is simpler life. Yeah. My energy consumption between when I was living in Silicon Valley to my village life probably dropped by a factor of 50 or a factor of 70. My energy consumption. Hmm. I don't think we, we should not. Yeah, we should not. And, and we, we have an urgent problem. By now, I think uh, you know, it's not a political issue, global warming. It's uh, no uh, existential issue for us. Mm. And this requires a holistic rethinking of what are we here for. Mm. And to me, that contentment naturally comes in those surroundings. It's not like I have to force myself to be content. Mm. You live there, you become content. Yeah. There's no need. So, there's no need, yeah. yeah. Like last night, I, you know, I saw the full moon, mm. I think. Uh, and I was taking a walk mm. you know, just before I got on to come to Trivandrum. It was so beautiful. Yeah. And I said, I, this is all I need, you know. I don't know uh, what's money, what's all that. Mm. So you also have to have that sense. True. That's also why I'm there in rural India. <laughs> so, to keep that sense, not lose that core. So, so will it become your full-time effort sometime in the future? I Definitely both. See, as a nation, we have to figure out all these complex technologies we ourselves are using. Mm. It's not, see, if everybody were a Ramana Maharishi, we don't need any technology, we can be peaceful. But we need all the technology. We want our smartphone, we want this, we want the MRI machine, all that. Mm. So we have to do all that. Mm. But at the same time, we don't have contentment. We have all that, we don't have contentment. We are going to destroy ourselves too. So it's like a very difficult chess puzzle we face, right? Every move loses. Mm. And then you realize the answer is not on the board. We have to think some other dimension. That's where the spiritual dimension comes in. You are able to maintain the balance of. That's I'm hope I'm I'm you know, hoping to. <laughs> you know. That's uh, why I live there. That's why you live there. I, that's ultimately you know all of the other development, all the R and D. I live there because I want spiritually to be contented. That's that's why I live there. But as an entrepreneur <coughs> and a you know head of an organization, what are your thoughts on succession? What happens? From I I talk <coughs> I talk to our co-founders. Mm. All of them about it. Obviously, nobody gets to live forever. <laughs> yeah. So, but we are, you know, we have a lot of younger people in the company who are coming up well. Mm -hmm. So, this one thing we know, mm -hmm. it'll be somebody already, I always tell people, it'll be somebody who already works here. <laughs> because I don't believe in this whole professionally searching and executive search form to bring in all that. We ought to be culturally grounded, rooted. That's how we'll. But the world is full of a lot of good successful stories and not yeah. so good stories with people coming from outside. Yeah. You, you have a strong belief that this culture I, cannot be transplanted? Not because of that. I'm just saying that it's, it's also, you, you have to accept, a, the, we are not for everyone, okay? but mm. I'd say this, because mm. there's a lot of peculiar things about us, right? These kinds of ideas. Mm. See, I'm talking about one side of, Thing I'm talking about inventing all this technology. We are only at 1 billion. Apple is at 250 billion. I'm also talking about contentment. Mm. Is that a contradiction? I mean, it appears like a contradiction, right? But I'm saying that clearly you, you go to a rural poor person, they need more prosperity. Nobody should be stuck in poverty. Right. At the same time, if you are an affluent person in Delhi or in Chennai, mm. maybe we should be more contented. <laughs> so both... There is there is a connection between the two. That's what I'm saying. And if you were, let's say, not doing what you're doing, and you hadn't started with tech, I probably would have been teaching somewhere. That would so in a way, I'm, that's what I'm doing now. I'm teaching. I mean, no, in a different way. In you our teach in school, your own school, right? School, all that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't get a lot of time to teach, but I once in a while I interact with the kids and share stories, yeah. <laughs> tell stories. And okay. what is then one moral value that you are very particular about that the children in your school and your employees should I take say from you? stay rooted and grounded wherever you go. Mm. Don't forget your roots. Be true to your, you know, what brought you here. Mm. That's your parents, your ancestors, your ancestral deities, this village, this all this. Mm. Hold this to be sacred. Well, that's the way that we get the idea that the earth is sacred. 
if we don't respect our own village, if we don't respect our own ancestors, all of it, we are not going to respect the earth. So I think that's 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 what I teach. Have that respect mm. that we should we should take care of this, mm. should pass it on to future generations. That's the most important value at all of all. Right. But along the way, you know, figure out complicated stuff <laughs> because we are using complicated stuff. We are using. <laughs> yeah. Right. We are, we are uh, way too much surrounded by too many technologies. Is it going to go further up or there will be a plateau? Yesterday, I actually spoke about this topic in our very company where some young people asked me, we have a town hall every day, yeah. every week. Once a week, we have a town hall like this where right. people ask me questions, mm. which, which is only within the company. And some one of our employees asked, you know, I, I know what you say, but I have all these desires. I'm full of ego. How do I get out of it? Trap? I said, you know, turn off the phone sometimes <laughs> and do some fasting. Yeah. I actually fast, yeah. but uh, you know, intermittent fasting. Mm. We control our food craving, we control all our cravings. Yeah, if this is again a whole wisdom. Yeah. yeah, the essential craving we all have is food craving. Oh, yeah. We can control that, we control all other cravings. And so then the, other, the, 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 in the, in the mind, you train your mind to this thing and then turn off the phone once in a while, you know, two, three hours, don't doom scrolling, you know. <laughs> that's what puts you in this state of agitation all the time. I said, you have to learn to do these things. Mm. And we have to do this even in Zoho, you know, a lot of people are trapped in this. Yeah. Doom scrolling, binge watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reels and reels. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you've been always been vocal about, uh, uh, you know, not taking uh, private money or listing the organization, no quarter yeah. to quarter pressure and in fact that was one of our reasons why we mm. uh, did a strategic sale because of the reason that the yeah. family needed money for some uh, other investment uh, but we always had in mind that you know we yeah. can't have somebody knocking on the door and say that yeah. you know, number the cow you know what what, what is yeah. happening this quarter and yeah. whether you like it or you don't right. like it whether it is a season not a season you have to answer and then uh, but, but is, is that how you yeah. were also thinking or there is some other? I, I'll give you a very concrete answer. Last um, couple of weeks ago, somebody reported our numbers because we had to file with the yeah. registrar of companies. Arusha, we are very yeah. much an Indian companies. Yeah. And it reported that uh, compared to 2021, 2022 or whatever the number had fallen in terms of profit. Revenue had grown up, profit had fallen. And I read it and said, oh, did it fall? <laughs> Why? Because I'm a completely unperturbed by it because, I mean, we make decisions on investing in this data center, that expansion, global expansion, all that, R&D, more R&D projects, more investment in this. Mm. For example, we are doing everything from MRI machines to medical instruments to whatnot. Right. And the timing of those could vary where suddenly we make a you know, investment in this, profit will fall. Yeah. Because you are writing down that investment, right? Yeah. You are not making money yet. Correct. You will not make money for a long time. So, if we were a public company, I have to quarter to quarter, I have to show that growth, profit growth. You'll stop making pressure. those investments. Exactly. So, now we are starting schools and whatnot. Whenever we get the chance, we do it. We don't think about will it affect this quarter, next quarter, next quarter, all that. That's freedom. I don't want to lose that freedom. That freedom is worth more than money to me. Mm. And do you see people today, especially young entrepreneurs, are swayed by? The glamour of unicorns uh, and funding uh, and uh, this race, that Definitely. Race. Again, see if you're caught in a particular bubble area, mm. because everybody you meet is like that. That's why I say you should go out some more. Right? You travel in Sonbadra. Mm. You are in Tenkasi. I am. It's a totally different world. Nobody is worried about unicorns. The conversation is very different. Very different. Nobody is worried about unicorns. Yeah. And remember, that's the vast majority of our population. So again, this is another thing that every young person watching this should bear in mind. If you're watching this, you are maybe the top 10 percentile of our population, right? Yeah. And there is 90% of us in India. Have no clue. Oh, no clue about all this. It's that person I worry about, the 90%. Mm. How do you create a decent life? At the same time, a contented life so that, and this 10% has to set a role model. Because a lot of it is set by movies and all that, the glamour. Mm. And you know, a flashy car, 
that you know a movie star buys every one of the followers watches it right they aspire to that so we have to set these role models otherwise we you know again as mentioned we cannot consume our way to prosperity we cannot consume our way to and prosperity. we we cannot consume our way to contentment <laughs> absolutely so we have a we need to have a an idea of prosperity in our country mm. that's rooted in contentment it appears like a complete contradiction what is prosperity and contentment how are they related but they are they are related that's if you understand anything at all about our spiritual heritage the prosperity rooted in contentment is the only kind of prosperity that will last do you think this should be part and parcel of our education system it has to be it has to be part of our training mm. and it has to be part of also how prominent people live mm. right cuz other people take role models, models. Yeah, yeah role models and that's that's also important so there is a responsibility yeah there is a responsibility and do you in our country we have a responsibility even more than anywhere else yeah because i always keep in mind this 22 million babies born mm. maybe 2 million will be in a position to think about all this mm. there's another 20 million out there so that's what we have to keep in mind do you feel the sense of responsibility on I your do. shoulders i do i do and your actions i i always think about that 90% and what are we doing for that and then to me the more money we make in business hmm. i always feel the more our responsibility grows yeah so now I mean, as they say you know you which is why up this is the demographic uh, riches here we have to serve here that's why I'm, even though i don't speak hindi i'm learning a little bit now i'm learning to read i was illiterate yeah. now i can read the signs all that mm-hmm. i intend to come here some day and live for a period in places like that too so you know you make a million as you you make 100 million other people you are yeah. just holding it yes. till it goes back yeah. mahatma gandhi was right you are a trustee you are holding you are it for the society and broader world because that's that's our dharma there is no other way in which i can see us reconcile the environment nature with prosperity it all is rooted there i mean when you think deep about it mm. see today there are no solutions here this is not like us or europe or japan or china or anybody have solutions to these problems so sure. everybody is flailing around about this which is why there is no consensus about what to do for climate change meanwhile the emissions are going up still going up so is that your area of focus in your philanthropic efforts also it's, apart it's, from doing for the people that you yeah. closely work with definitely we are investing in more sustainability mm. for example take water this whole all over india it's true we are going deeper and deeper for exploiting groundwater mm. everywhere yeah it's deep bore well it's very dangerous two reasons one the land subsides first we lose the aquifer completely mm. the land settles on that so and so flooding and all that increase get worse the second that you go that deep that has poison arsenic called that arsenic. it seeps into the water so we cannot go that deep we need to have better surface water mm. i'm very glad we have a now a jal shakti ministry mm. to uh, to really water is very critical so one of the things i do wherever we go is we dig ponds dig pond we dig ponds mm. to store the rain water mm. like last year we dug a lot of ponds during the dry season last year was very dry then the big rains arrive the wall over ponds are full mm. now we are able to continue agriculture from those ponds mm. we are not doing deep bore wells So I'm no, going to shut down all our water wells and only water, uh, water table is good now. Mm. I want to make sure. In fact, I believe in our current juncture, 10 to 15 percent of surface area has to be dedicated to ponds. 10 to 15 percent. 15 percent. All the surface area has to be dedicated for water. Mm. We cannot do deep bore well. In fact, I hope that the government will adopt a ban on going bil- below 50 or 100 feet. All that. Yeah. That's very dangerous for us. so that's again one of the sustainability sustainable planting trees greenery all of it mm. so all, everything is linked our way of life where the water comes from how we treat animals all of it is linked is there any organization around it that you are supporting we support a lot of organizations doing work we ourselves are doing yeah. work so well, this has been a fantastic conversation Thank you. i would really love uh, your final message from your side to 
the viewers of Josh Talks, uh, who are, you know, right now sitting in their garages, in their houses, somewhere in the US, you know, thinking about going back and building a legacy. So what should they do? How should they do it uh, in terms of their outlook for life and building a legacy? So as I said, our challenge, if you, I've stated our challenge as a nation, the R&D and R&D. We need research and development to, to really develop our rural areas. At the same time, we have to figure out the challenge of prosperity rooted in contentment. So remember the humility and content. That's, that's really all. So R&D, R&D, humility, contentment. Those are the themes I want people to take people away. People to imbibe. Yeah. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You.